you know, subject anyone to that long of a reading. Um, so we're reading today out of John's Gospel, chapter 9. And we're going to be, as we're in this season of Lent, we're spending a lot of time with John in the coming weeks. Um, so we're in John chapter 9. We're going to read the whole chapter. And one of the reasons I wanted to, um, to read it is because there's some things I want to point out as we're reading. It says this, as he went along, remember that statement there, okay? Because that statement is going to come back to speak to us again. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, okay, blind from when? Birth, birth thank you. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Which is funny because how could he have sinned to cause blindness if he's been blind from birth? Come on, disciples. Think about that. But they don't get it. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened. So, oh, and that, let me just pause right there. You will hear preachers throughout, who have throughout history, who have pointed to calamities, natural disasters, sicknesses, tragedies, and said, well, this must have been something you did. And Jesus is saying, no. No. That's not what this is. You could preach a whole sermon right there on that verse. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After this, here's where things get really fun. He spit on the ground. Leave it to your imagination of what that sound didn't look like. Made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. It's a pleasant thought, isn't it? Especially in our era of COVID. <laughs> Go, he told the man. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. They brought the man to the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Um, just really briefly right there, I want to, you probably are wondering why that is. Um, so Matthew chapter 8, something very similar happens that I just want to um, bring up. And this is just 8 verse 1. Jesus came down from the mountainside. Large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand, touched him and said, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately he was cleansed from his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded. So there's a reason why he goes to the Pharisees here. If you, you get healed, they are the ones who confirm the miracle. All right, back to our scripture. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It is your eyes who open. The man replied, he is a prophet. And they still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. 
Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided anyone who acknowledges that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Speaking of Jesus, he replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open his, your eyes? Like, are you kidding me? He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. Can you hear the sarcasm? That is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in your sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you are now seeing him. And in fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So that's kind of the picture of the Pharisees right there. Um, so we're still in the series on walking the path of Lent, and today we're talking about uh, that, that guy. So this is one of the more bizarre stories in the Gospels, and it is only found, this blind beggar, is only found in the Gospel of John. Here we see that Jesus is fresh off of a confrontation with the Pharisees, and he's healing this blind man. He had just finished a long debate with the Jews who were viewing him with suspicion. He'd been telling them that just being Jewish didn't mean that they were children of Abraham, which then escalates into a shouting match. Let me read you a little bit about that. That's from chapter 8, and that starts at verse 34. And listen to this. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me. Because you have no room for my word. I am telling you, what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. Woo! And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his own native language, for he is a lie, father of lies. And then it finishes up with this in verse 48. 
The Jews answered to them, Are we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, whoever obeys my words will never see death. And they exclaimed, now we know. See, the exclamation right now, this is where it's becoming a shouting match. Now we know you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, whoever obeys, can you hear the, the elevated pitch here? Can you hear this? Whoever obeys your word, you will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glory in myself, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He was glad. He saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. And that I am is very specific to what God told Moses. I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. So that's the story. They were ready to stone him for blasphemy. So Jesus slips away and leaves the temple area. Our text that we read to begin, John chapter 9, begins with Jesus leaving the area. That's why I said pay attention to that. As he went along, Jesus has just left this confrontation. And he proceeds to perform a miracle. Well, there's a lot of things that are going on here that can get passed over if we don't pay really close attention to what's being said. Jesus spits into the dirt to make mud, and then puts that mud onto the man's eyes. Remember, we have the mental picture there. It's really not a pleasant one. There are several references to spitting in Scripture that leads us to believe that this is, this is not necessarily a, a good thing. You have numbers where Moses is having an issue with his wife. Unsure what that issue is. A lot of people believe that he was separating himself from her. But Miriam and Aaron complain to God about it. And God comes down and says, Who are you to complain about to my servant Moses, the meekest man in all the earth? And you hear the word from prophets, but I speak to Moses face to face. And Miriam, who apparently was leading this accusation, is turned into a leper. Really good Old Testament happy scripture. And so they're begging him, they beg Moses to pray to God. That she be healed. So it says this. So Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? It's a disgrace. The words of Job, chapter 17. Job's in, the, in a world of hurt. God has made me a byword to everyone, a man in whose face people. Jesus, in Mark's gospel, describes the coming abuse that he will be subjected to. And he says this, We are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests. And the teachers of the law, they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And of course, we have Jesus speaking in Revelation chapter 3 to the church at Laodicea. Remember, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Spitting back then, as now, you've seen videos where somebody's hands are tied and the best thing they can do is spit in somebody's face. Back then, as now, it is an insult. It is a shaming tactic. But by making a mixture of mud out of it and spreading the filthy mixture on the beggar's eyes on the Sabbath to accomplish the healing, this was a scandal. 
spit, mud, Sabbath, all at once. A scandal. But there's a subtle message here, I think. Jesus is using the very tools of shaming in our society to heal somebody whose life was full of shame. He turns it back in on itself. Has him washed. And now the beggar who is, lives in shame is made whole. But here's the point. The miracle. It is obvious. It is verifiable. There are so many witnesses to this. People who knew the beggar. Who can now see. But it all gets lost in the debate over Jesus. The blind man, he's come back from rinsing his eyes. He can see and his, his friends and the family, they, they confirm that he's the one. We know him. They say he's of age, so he's 18 or above. They've always known him. Plenty of people recognize him as the blind beggar. He's brought to the Pharisees, as you're supposed to. They're the religious scholars. They can verify the healing. They're supposed to do that. But they don't. Because there's two things that really stop them from, from recognizing this. Number one, but they just plain out hated Jesus. <laughs> they just hated him. And you understand why, because we talked about that, right? As he went along, I told you to remember that in verse 1, because he had just left that massive confrontation he had had with him. They hate him already. And these are the same ones. That's you be surprised or wonder. And they're also upset at the fact that the miracle was performed on the Sabbath. It doesn't matter that it's a miracle. It was performed on the Sabbath. But this is actually, so Jesus has already done this before. This is the second miracle he's performed on the Sabbath because earlier he heals uh, the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida on the Sabbath. And we'll see Sabbath healings in the other Gospels as well. The healing, though, it occurs just after the major confrontation. And they've already formed their opinions of Jesus at this point. Their minds will not be changed. Not going to happen. And when the man who has been healed pleads his case in response to them, they turn their anger towards him as well. The Pharisees have, according to Jesus then, become intentionally blind. Verse 35 of our text says this, Then Jesus heard it, they thrown him out. When he found them, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He said, Who is he, sir, that I might believe? And Jesus tells him who he is, and he says, I believe. And he says, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And the Pharisees asked him, What? Are we blind too? They can plainly see that a miracle has happened. You cannot deny it. It's verifiable. Witnesses, family, lots of people. Yet they refuse to acknowledge the work of God. And instead, I don't know if you caught this or not, but they chalk this up to forgery. The scripture here says this. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, we know this man is a sinner. Give glory to God by telling the truth. Essentially, they are accusing both the man and his parents of lying about the condition. Lying about it. You weren't really blind from birth. You likely weren't even blind. Because there's no way, because we know this Jesus is a sinner. Because they refuse to see the plain truth of the miracle, Jesus tells them they are blind, and it is they who will be subject to judgment. And they will look to stone him again not long after this in chapter 10, 
verse 24, there's another opportunity for them to stone Jesus that he gets out of. And see, the point is this. It doesn't matter how many good works he does, how many miracles he performs, they cannot see past their own opinions of him. And they cannot see past their own traditions. The way that they've always done their faith. There was one way in which God is supposed to work. And when healings takes place on the Sabbath by someone who has been openly critical of them, the Pharisees cannot see the miracles. They can only see Jesus and their disagreements with him. They can't see past any of it. So here's the point of all. The Pharisees' reaction to this miracle in this chapter, John chapter 9, I think is a cautionary tale for all of us. As we move through our lives, all of us form habits through life. The way that we get up in the morning, the way that we dress, the foods that we like, the coffee we drink in the morning, how we drink our coffee, which should be drank cold with ice and creamer. So you know, that is the scripturally appropriate way of drinking coffee. And decaf is a sin. But there are ways of things that we come up with in our opinions. And, and as we continue to go through life, our opinions stop being opinions. And they become fact. And they harden into a hard surface within us. I mean, look, I think it's a natural process of life. I really do. It's just what it's like. Yet this can cause us to see that something that God is doing and discount it, or worse, call it a forgery. And that's what we saw the Pharisees doing. Because it's different from how we have experienced life, we will doubt its legitimacy and come up with reasons why it must be wrong. The best and most recent example of that is the revival that was taking place up at Asbury University. Many of you have heard of it. Some of you probably are like, what are you talking about? Google it. Asbury is a Methodist college, and they had a, like a Sunday night chapel. And it was a worship time, they were singing, there was some preaching, and they did some more singing. And it went on and on into day two, into day three, into day four, into day five, and continued. More and more people started coming. More and more people started finding that their lives were being changed. It's called the Asbury Revival now, it's famous. Like I said, go home and Google it, it was just a couple weeks ago. And yet, there were a number of people, prominent preachers, who said, this is fake. This is a forgery. Well, number one, they don't heard you. I kid you not, I heard this. They don't use the King James Bible. So it can't be real. Number two, I also heard this. They don't follow our creed and our message. I won't tell you the denominations, it doesn't matter. But it can't be real. Number three, they're not singing hymns. They're singing these other songs that aren't legitimate. What it all boils down to is this is not a real revival. And yet people's lives were being changed. And people on the outside started missing what was happening because they had their rules set in place as to how this could happen and how this can't happen. This is what the Pharisees were doing. As people of God, we have to remember that God still wants to work in us. As a church, but as individuals as well. Do not miss that. Oftentimes, God can and does use our gifts, our talents, and our abilities to neatly fit with who we are as persons and 
who we are as communities. Oftentimes. On the other hand, there are times when God wants to do something new. Both in the church and in individual lives. Something that may take you or me out of a comfort zone of our experiences. To put you in a place that is very different than what you're used to. These are paradigm shifting moves of God that can be unsettling for us. Have you ever experienced something like that? To where God takes you to a direction and a place that is not something that makes you comfortable. The Pharisees were certainly unsettled by what Jesus was doing. You healed somebody on the Sabbath. You did it using spit. That's not how you're supposed to do this, Jesus. But if we get caught in, this is the way I've always done this. We can actually be our own source of blindness. Our own source of blindness. Unwilling to allow God to take us in some way, new direction. Something where God wants to explode in us. But I, God, won't, that's, that's not how you work in me. Like the Pharisees, we can be right in the middle of God's move and be unable to see. So many of you know that in 2017, I was pastoring a church in Germany. And through sickness and illness and a bunch of circumstances, I had to give up the church and we came back here. I sent out resumes. I sent out tapes of preaching to so many churches. Could not get a call back, could not get even an acknowledgement of my resume. Nothing. And not once in that time did I think, well, I'll just go become a Methodist. Won't that work out? It never occurred to me to do something like that. So for the period of 17, 18, and 19, I wandered. Do this, do that, trying to understand. I had a plan. This is the path that I was taking. This is how it's going to work. I've been on this journey to become a pastor for all these years, and this is how it's supposed to happen. And it all came crashing down. And then another path opened. And I, many of you know, I've given up on the call of God. You've heard of people in, in ministry who have run from God's calling, who don't want any part of being a preacher or a minister, and they, they flee from it, like Jonah. I mourned because I had lost it, and I thought God's not going to use me anymore. I mourned over that. And then things began to change. Got a job at LCAC. Through that, I met a pastor, James Henry, at St. James. We started going there. I went on staff there. And then, hey, have you considered the Methodist path? Went through the candidacy process. Became licensed. While I became a pastor over at Springfield. And then I was licensed, and I became your pastor. All because I didn't tell the Lord, this is the only way it can be. This is the only path it can be. No, Jesus, you're doing it wrong. If we are willing to allow our opinions to be shaped by God, 
to allow our traditions to be shaped by God, to be set, to willing to set those aside and say, God, whatever direction you want me to go in, I will go. Then we can see blind eyes open. We can see lives change. The path to righteousness was obeying Torah. The path to righteousness was obeying and doing the things that you're supposed to do. And, and yet, Jesus comes and he says, I got something new for you. I have a new covenant. And so on that night, when he was betrayed, he's in the upper room with his disciples. And he sits them all down. He says, man, I've really been wanting to do this with you. And they're all at the table, and he takes the loaf of bread, and he, he breaks it, and he offers it to his disciples, and he says, take and eat this, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. Can you imagine Jesus looking you in the eyes and saying, my body is broken for you. For you. Broken for you, Malcolm. Broken for you, Bruce. For you, Jackie. For you, Wilson. For you, Rena. For you, Susan. This is my body which is broken for you. And then he took the cup. And he says, drink this all. This is my blood. And then he says, of the new covenant. Which is shed for you for the remission, for the forgiveness of your sins. No, this is not how things have been done. Be ready for change. And they drank from it. Still didn't understand it because as soon as they had done that, soldiers come and they all run away. But Jesus was still there. And so, Lord, we thank you today for these gifts of bread and juice. We ask that you make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for this world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. I say it all the time. I will say it every week. This is the table of the Lord. It is not Tim's table. It is not Silverbrook's table. It is not the table of the United Methodist Church. It is open to everyone. If you came in here today full of faith, Christian among Christians, this table is for you. If you came in here today, I don't even know if I believe any of this. This table is for you. It is open to all. Good old. Good night. I forgot to ask you to leave us. So this table is set. You are invited to come down here. And again, it is not me who invites you. It's not the Methodists who invite you. It is the Lord who invites you.